we're looking at Mark 1, verses 14 to 15, and 2, verses 1 to 12. Um, it's kind of part of a larger section of Mark that, that Tim has asked me to kind of look at. So that's really written from Mark 1, verse 14, through to 3, verse 19. And uh, really that section can be summarised as uh, Jesus establishes his ministry model, preaching the forgiveness of sin and sending others out to. Um, if you like that summary, it's not mine, Tim wrote that for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you don't like it, then he's the one. So there it is. Uh, yeah, we'll start by reading God's word. So this is starting with Mark. Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, and then we're going to jump into Mark 2. So Mark 1, starting at verse 14. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And they jumping on to 2, starting at verse 1. And when he returned to Capernaum, after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together, so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, Rise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, Rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he arose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. Amen. And God had his blessing to the reading of his word. So, I want to introduce you to someone. Um, if you can fire up the picture, please. Um, this is Jacob. Uh, my parents just got a new, new dog. Like, literally on Friday, my parents just got a dog called Jacob. And uh, to me, the timing of that seems a bit suspicious. I'm leaving a week on Monday to come here, and they seem to have got a dog to replace me, um, which seems a bit harsh, but he's lovely. He is lovely. Uh, they're, they're fostering this dog for six weeks, and uh, may look to adopt him after that. Uh, but the big question is, can they train him to walk to heal? My mum has quite a bad back and can't really deal with a dog that pulls on the lead very well. And so the question is, can he be trained not to do that? Can they get him to obey instructions? Will he listen to their authority? Through the section that we're looking at this evening, the kind of wider section, we see Jesus establishing and demonstrating his Authority. Jesus starts his ministry in making a proclamation. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. And so we see the original three point sermon delivered by Christ himself. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. So what we see happening here is we see the people of God waiting. If we dive back to Genesis 12, we see Abram given a promise that through his line a descendant would come and that he would bless all the earth. The Old Testament is replete with messianic prophecies. A word that I love, I love the word replete. And you don't get to use it often enough in conversations, but I love it. Time and time again, God tells his people that he's going to send a Messiah to redeem his people. 
And so, in saying that the time is fulfilled, Jesus is telling the people, you have waited for this Messiah, and now the Messiah is here. Jesus then continues his proclamation to say, the kingdom of God is at hand. Well, what does that mean? What does the kingdom of God look like? What Jesus is doing is he's establishing the rule and the reign of God has come in a more tangible way than ever before. The Son of God is here. Mark puts that right at the start of his gospel. This is Jesus, the Son of God. We can't miss that. The presence of God is here in a way that it's never been before. God is doing a new thing among the people and it started. Jesus is here to proclaim it. Jesus is here to demonstrate it. And Jesus is here to bring it about. The King has come and he has come to demonstrate his authority. If you scan through Mark 1, 14 through to 3, 19, you'll see that the word authority comes up three times, which is admittedly not a massive number of times. However, if we broaden that out slightly to demonstrations of authority, then we'll see that Mark 1, 14 through to 3.19 is absolutely replete with these examples. I couldn't resist, sorry. <laughs> um, so Mark 1, 16 to 20, Jesus calls his disciples. Well, who can call people to follow them unless they have authority. I suppose you can call them, but they might not do it unless you have an authority. Jesus, uh, Mark 1, 21 through to 28, Jesus drives out an unclean spirit. Jesus has the authority not only to drive out the spirit, but also to command it to be silent. Mark 1, 29 to 34, and 40 to 45, and 3, 1 to 6, Jesus heals many people. Je Jesus demonstrates his authority over sickness and casts out more, de more demons. And people begin to serve him as one with authority. Mark 1, 35 to 39, Jesus teaches with authority. People come from all over to hear Jesus, to, uh, to hear him teach, because he teaches in a new way, and he teaches as one with authority. They are astonished at his new teaching, because it comes with authority. Mark 2, 1 to 12, the healing of the paralyzed man, which we'll look at in more detail shortly, but again, Jesus demonstrates his authority to forgive sins and to physically heal people. Mark 2, 13 to 17, Jesus calls Levi and again demonstrates his authority, calling someone to follow him who has lived as a hated man and who has cheated people or potentially cheated people. And so this man, this man so responds to Jesus' authority that he seeks to make, make restitution where he has wronged people. Mark 2, 18 to 28, Jesus demonstrates his authority over the religious leaders of the time their interpretation of the law, whether that's because of the Sabbath or whether that's to do with fasting. Jesus teaches them in a new way and he shows his authority. Mark 3, 7 to 12, again, more people follow Jesus, responding to his teaching with authority. More demons are cast out, recognising him as the Son of God and being commanded to be silent by someone who is in authority over them. And finally, Mark 3, 13 to 19, Jesus sends out his disciples. Well, who can send people out except someone with authority? Not only that, but Jesus renames three of the disciples. Simon renames Peter. James and John, he calls the sons of thunder. So maybe he's just actually renaming <coughs> Zebedee. But that would be a great name to be given. Thunder. I would like that. That would be cool. Uh, yeah. Anyway, maybe you don't pick up on the significance of that, but you need authority to name things. Your parents named you. No one else can change your name. I can't start calling Tim Gavin, for example, although I might, because it'd be really funny. <laughs> <laughs> Even if I did, it's not going to change his name. I might just irritate him slightly. 
Believably, Tim has the authority to change his name, but no one else could. This is meant to cast our minds back to Genesis 2 and the Garden, where we see where things are right between man and God, and we see Adam is given the authority to name God, to name them, to not to name God, <laughs> to give the authority by God to name the plants and animals. That was quite a full bar, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, he's given the authority to name the plants and the animals. And it's really significant that as we see Jesus preaching and establishing his rule and reign, and the rule and reign of God has come, we see him renaming people. We see him renaming because he has authority. Now, I could go on and on, and I already have gone on and on, but I could go and give you several more examples of Christ demonstrating his authority over things like nature and like death. And all of these things are found in Mark's Gospel eh, and we'll be seeing them in the coming weeks. Establishing who Jesus is and the authority that he clearly has is a high priority in Mark's thinking. Jesus declares that he's here now and now the kingdom of God is at hand. The rule and reign of God is at hand and is going to be established in a new way on the earth. So what does the rule and reign of God look like eh, for his people and how does that change our lives? Well, that is a good question. Jesus goes on to tell us, repent and believe the gospel. And so we're going to look at that, what it means to repent, what it means to believe the gospel with this case study of Mark 2, 1 to 12. Um, So... I'm going to start, we're going to just read the part of that again. So, Mark 2, verses 1 to 4. And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together, so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. So what we see here, not using, what we see here (laughs) is that Jesus is there teaching and generally doing his Jesus thing. And as usually happens, a massive crowd is gathered to hear him, such that there is no more room available. Entering into this scene comes a group of people, including five friends, one of whom is paralysed and being carried by the other four. Finding they couldn't get close to him, eh, they decided that the appropriate thing to do is to dig through the roof and lower their friend in front of Christ. That's surely a social faux pas, nothing else. Um, I want us to see three things here though. So firstly, we see that there is a radical desire to get to Christ. Now hopefully you realise that this is not a normal story. And I think maybe one of the things that happens to us is that we become too familiar with these stories for our own good. We don't see how radical this move is. They are digging through the guy's roof. That is not a normal thing to do, to dig through someone's roof so you can lower your friend in front of someone. It's not normal in any culture, any context. It is not a normal thing to do. But clearly, they are desperate to get their friend to Jesus. Secondly, look at the radical expectation on what they think Christ will do. Again, digging through the roof is an extreme one. It's an extreme move, no matter (laughs) what way you look at it. And if they are that desperate to get their friend to Christ, They must have high expectations of what Christ is going to do for a friend. Why bother? Why dig through his roof? Because I would be thinking I'm going to get in real trouble for this. So why do it? Why dig through the roof unless you have an expectation of what Jesus is going to do? Thirdly, look at the trust they have in the grace of Christ. Again, they've just dug through the roof of the house. 
if you did that to my house, or even if you did it here whilst I was preaching, you would at the very least be met with a look of cynicism. <laughs> but more than likely, I would be pretty miffed. Yet, here they find themselves so trusting in the grace of Christ, and the gracious response of Christ, that they dig through the roof of the house and lower their friend in front of him, still expecting that he will help their friend. Still expecting a gracious response from him. I wonder if we have that same kind of desperation, that same kind of radical trust in the grace of Christ. And if we did have that, how would that affect our prayer lives, our devotional lives? If we felt some of that same desperation to come to Christ, just to get to the feet of Christ, trusting in his grace, trusting in his love, trusting that he has the power to save and to heal, where is our desperation to come to Christ? Where is our drive to so get to the feet of Jesus, to know that getting to his feet will find healing and grace and love? Where is that drive in us? When evangelicals talk about our sinfulness and the sinfulness of humanity, part of that is just an accurate reflection of the natural state of humans according to the Bible. But really what we want is not to lay upon people, guilt upon guilt upon people who are struggling in their souls with difficult things. Instead what we're looking to do and is that we want that to help us to understand how desperately we need to get to Jesus. How much we've been forgiven by him. How desperately we need to come to Christ and how graciously we will be received by him. So what is stopping us coming to Christ today? Is it that there's a crowd gathered around him? Or is it really a failure to understand a desperate need to get to him? Moving on to the next part of our passage, Mark 2, verses 6 and 7. <clears throat> Uh, now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts why does this man speak like that he's blaspheming who can forgive sins but God alone so the scribes on hearing Jesus pronounce forgiveness of this man's sins are outraged they complain that God alone can forgive sins so who is this Jesus who does he think he is that he can do it Part of the basis of their complaint is found in Psalm 51. Um, and so in Psalm 51, we see David having been confronted by Nathan the prophet um, just after David's had his affair with Bathsheba, pouring out his heart to God. David is pouring out his heart to God. And verse 4 reads, Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. If you know the story of David and Bathsheba, you'll know that David has had Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, killed in order that he might take Bathsheba as his wife. So it seems a strange thing to say that against God and God alone has David sinned. Well, what about Uriah? He was effectively killed by David. What about Bathsheba, who has had her husband killed by David? What about the army generals eh, who were complicit in bringing about Uriah's death? Has David not sinned against these people? No. Against God and God alone has David sinned. Why? Well, because God is in authority. God sets the rules and David broke them. <coughs> We see something of this reflected in the, in the law today. If someone is tried for murder, it's a case of the crown against who that is. Well, why? Because the queen is sovereign over the land. She sets the laws, and when people break those laws, it's an offence against the queen. And therefore, the crown seeks justice. 
You hear similar things over in America where it's the state against whoever. It's the same idea. The state sets the rules and when the rules are broken, although there may be another victim, it's the law of the state that's been broken and therefore the state that prosecutes and seeks justice. And so, if, as the scribes argue, our sin is against God and God alone, then how can Jesus possibly claim to forgive it? And if he can forgive it, what does that tell us about Christ? Ultimately, you can only forgive a debt that is owed to you. You can't forgive a debt that is owed to someone else because you lack the authority. So, Jesus here, in claiming to forgive this man's sin, is making a very clear claim that the debt is owed to him. And therefore, Christ is claiming that he is God, or at very least, speaks with the authority of God. Now, we know, because we saw it last week, that Mark isn't playing around. He's wanting us to understand that this Jesus is the Son of God. It's the first thing Mark tells us about Christ. Mark 1 verse 1. The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. This is God's Son in their midst and he is about to prove that he has the power and the authority to forgive sins. So let's see him do that. Mark Mark 2 verses 8 to 12. And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, Rise up, take your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive (coughs) sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, Rise Pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. Here we see Jesus making a very simple point. We can't see the debt of sin. We can't see that debt we owe. And so to say to someone that their sin is forgiven is something that there's no proof of. So Jesus demonstrates his power and his authority and his ability to forgive sin in a way that quite clearly can be seen. In a very real, very tangible display of power and authority, Christ eh, says to a man, who is known to be paralysed. Get up, take up your bed and walk. And the paralysed man stoops down, takes up his bed and walks away. Jesus is using this physical healing as a clear proof of his spiritual healing. He's using this physical healing as a clear display of his authority to forgive sin. So what are we to learn from this passage? Well, as I've already said, we need to see the desperation of this man and his friends to get to Christ. We need to know that we will be met with grace. That we'll not be cast away, but we can be met with the grace of Christ who sees us in our need. We'll not be condemned or rebuked for coming to Christ in our desperation and in our need. We just need to get to the feet of Jesus. He will meet us with mercy and with grace. Christ knows. He knows what we struggle with. He knows what we mess up. He knows that we mess up time and time again. You coming to Christ in your sin and in your need is not going to surprise him. He knows. We are called to put our faith in him 
because it is by our faith that we are forgiven. Christ has clearly displayed his power and his authority to forgive sin. The cross of Christ stands as the ultimate testimony of that forgiveness. The cross stands as a place where our forgiveness was bought. It's the place where the blood of Christ was shed and his body was broken that we might be forgiven. The resurrection stands in a moment in history that proves our sin is done. That sin has no power over us anymore. We are forgiven and we can be forgiven if we will but put our faith in Christ and come to his feet. Ultimately, that's the thing that Jesus tells us to do. We must repent and believe the gospel for the kingdom of God is here. This is our hope. And ultimately, this is our only hope. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your word. We give you thanks for your gospel, for the glorious news of your Son coming to earth to call us to repentance and to call us to believe in him. And ultimately, Lord, to make a way for us to be forgiven through his cross, through his death, and through his resurrection. Lord, we give you thanks for the reality of that. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to trust in Christ, to know our desperation and our need for him, and help us to run to him in that need, Lord. Lord, we give you thanks that we know we can come to you and receive grace. Lord, we ask you to help us to trust in that grace. Trust in your gospel. Help us to repent and help us to believe. In Jesus' name.